Women Innovators. Interviews with women with big messages and big missions, sharing their stories to inspire you to live your passion and step up to make the world a better place. Here's your host, Tammy Patzer. Hi, this is Tammy Patzer, and I'm really excited to introduce you to today's guest, Sheila Skolnick. Sheila's story is a true rags to riches story. Sheila created and started her own international hotel supply company with no money, no experience, no mentors, and no connections. Years later, Sheila sold her business to a $6 billion company, which is the hotel supply division of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. You want to listen very closely and take notes because Sheila did this all 100% organically, meaning she did it all on her own and she figured it out as she went along. You're going to learn firsthand how you can create a very successful business from a woman who has actually been in the trenches. Her keynote speeches and workshops will inspire, teach, and motivate. Her business and personal guiding principles will be a vehicle to guide you in both your business and your personal life. On a more personal level, Sheila overcame challenges that included poverty, an almost non-existent education, a dysfunctional home, and a very dangerous neighborhood. Sheila taught, Sheila taught herself how to read in high school, and she developed a no-excuses mindset. Today, she works as a business advisor, group trainer, and, of course, as a keynote speaker. Sheila is an engaging speaker whose story of persistence and passion is relevant for all levels of business, entrepreneurs, startup companies, high school students, and college students. You will leave her keynote adventures with great knowledge and a sense of, if it's to be, it's up to me. This is Sheila's number one principle. So I want to introduce you right now to Sheila Skolnick. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Tammy. What a great introduction. I really appreciated hearing all this again. Thank you. No problem. I'm really excited because you are someone who everyone needs to hear from because you're an example of a woman who, despite the odds, you know, no education, dysfunctional home, growing up in a bad neighborhood, you had an idea and you did what most people fail to do. You implemented it and you figured it out along the way. So first of all, tell me a little bit more about the people you help. And then, of course, tell me how in the world did you do this? Well, the people that I help are uh, business owners um, that want to uh, grow their companies and feel stuck and don't know how. Um, entrepreneurs that have to figure out how to get started, and also small to mid-sized businesses as well. Um, they need to learn another way of looking at their business. Everyone has learned from basically the same book of how things are supposed to look, how things are supposed to get done, and none of that is necessarily true. Um, just as long as you do things that are correct, do it. For example, one of my sayings that I created um, and I use and people use back at me, and, and that is say yes to everything except if it can hurt you, someone else is illegal or immoral. So if an opportunity come up, don't go, oh, I don't know how to do that. 
think about it for a second, and if it passes the four criteria, do it. And what can it hurt? It can only it can only lead you to another direction that's very helpful. Things don't have to be a straight line. A road can have curbs and bumps. Just keep going with it. As a matter of fact, I was at a um, at a trade show and I was asked by these gentlemen that represented the mayor's office, and they asked me if I would like to join the mayor. You know, if I pass all uh, criteria for a trade show exposition in Hong Kong. I said, let me think about that. I looked into it, and I got back to them, and I said yes. And that was the most, to this day, exciting experience I've ever had, going to another country as a VIP. It was wonderful. So, you know, when I speak to customers and they ask me things, if it passes my criteria, then I do it. And many of my customers and my clients today, because now I don't have customers anymore because I'm not in the lodging industry anymore, you know, my variety of uh, principles help guide people into new thinkings. Did I answer your question? Oh, my goodness. I, it makes me have a, all of these other questions. So, so you have... You have your basic principles about taking opportunity, and Mm -hmm. I I think that that is really a place where I would like you to expand on that a little bit more because so often uh, people will not take an opportunity because of, of that fear, like, I don't know how to do that. Can you expand on that a little bit more and maybe tell me a story Um, besides your Hong Kong adventure? I loved that. Well, first of all, everyone knows how to do everything if they stop and try to think about it. And no matter what it is, someone's... So, for example, um, when I went door-to-door to to the hotels in Manhattan, I didn't know what to sell them. I didn't even know what to do. Only thing I did know is that these buildings were huge. I mean, thousands of rooms in some of the hotels. And I knew if I can sell them one product, it would go into every room, and I could make a lot of money. And the other thing I figured out, because it's all about logic, is that if I sold them something, I would get paid for sure. Because I didn't have any money. So when I say I didn't have any money, let's be specific. I had nothing. I had two children. I was the supporter of them. So I said, I have to sell to people that, have, that will pay their bills. So I would, go, I would go into the hotels, and I had to find my way down to housekeeping and purchasing. And what I would do is I would ask the buyer, Now, first of all, this did not happen easily because I didn't get, I didn't sell to hotels in Manhattan. It took me a year before I got my first order. But I'd ask them this question, and everyone really, really, really needs to write this down. I used to say to the purchasing agent, executive housekeeper, rooms division, whoever was in these huge buildings, I used to say, is there something you're looking for that your present supplier can't get you? Is there a price that you need that your present supplier isn't giving you? And finally, is there some service you require that you're not getting? And you know what? Everybody had something that they always needed or wanted that their present supplier. And I made a list of all these things. I just made a list. And then I would go to trade shows all over. I'm not talking hotel shows, just any kind of trade show. And I find it for them. Until I, uh, <laughs> till I was uh, the, the go-to person in the industry. And that's one huge industry to be the go-to person. And then finally, you know, not finally all of a sudden, but then I sold to corporate. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger because I never said no, I never said can't. And um, only time I would say no if it was illegal, immoral, would hurt me or someone else. That was my whole that, that were the only four things that would stop me from running forward. Um, wow. I'm, I'm, everybody, make, make sure you're taking notes because Sheila is actually giving you the keys to success. Persistence, asking the right questions, 
fulfilling an unmet need sound familiar? And, and think about it. Sheila didn't go to Wharton. She has what some people would call what Sheila common sense street. I sense, did go to college. Sense. No, no. But here's the thing. But come out. Here's the thing. I did go to college, but there's okay. nothing in college. There's nothing in college that. And I I got all A's in sales and marketing. I mean, I I had a huge. I, I had great grades in those things, but it didn't give you the thinking. You know, it taught you how things are supposed to look, how things are supposed to be, and it teaches you how things are done. You know, if I had a – I went and did it anyway. You know, if I had a mentor that I told that, hey, I'm going to go into this huge building and make millions and millions of dollars, they would go, you're delusional. You know, don't even think about it. I didn't listen to anybody but me. I, I used my own common sense. I used my own thoughts. And I just went in and did it because I, I always thought, what do I have to lose? No one's going to, you know, they're not going to laugh at me. And if they did, who cares? I'm the, and I didn't laugh all the way to the bank. I joyfully went all the way to the bank. It's just that, in, in, you know, the, the thing I'm trying to tell you, it's not from a lack of education. You know, I finally educated myself and did very, very well. As a matter of fact, um, I'm, my most proudest grade in high school at the end was I got an 87 in my regents, and that was huge for me because I taught myself one word, one letter at a time. But that's a whole story. But the bottom line is because of my horrific childhood, I, I always depended on me to take care of me, you know, as, as a survival. So when I made that decision um, upon entry into high school that I was going to teach myself to read, and that's it, I did. did the same kind of thinking when I entered Manhattan. You know, I'm going to, I looked at these buildings and I said, I'm going to sell to them. I don't know how. I don't even know who they are in the building. I don't even know their structure. I knew nothing. But I said, it's there. I'm here. I'm going to get her done. And I did. And really, I went into Manhattan uh, two times a week. And each time I went into Manhattan, I saw 13 hotels. So that was 26 hotels a week. And may I use the word hard, hard work. And the other three days, I was selling products um, locally in my small town of Port Jeff and, you know, on Long Island. Um, so it's a thinking. And, and when, I, when I give my trainings and when I give my keynotes, I give them my thinking. I tell them why I did what I did. Like, for example, one of the things I tell them, and this sounds so simple, but people really get it and they shift and change. When you go to sell somebody, only knock on the doors of people that have money. You think that's such a simple thing? I can't begin to tell you how many people went, oh, yeah. You know, you have to make a shift to change to just total logic. And the other thing is, in my business, I was, I was very honest, 100% honest. I believe if you're dishonest in any way, it, it'll catch up with you fast. And people will know. People are smart. People are sharp. At least in my industry, they were smart and sharp. Um, you have to be honest. You have to be truthful. You have to not worry about what you said, or you don't have to remember what you said. Just say the truth and do 100% what's good for your customer. Because they'll know. And then when they trust you, you know the old saying, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. That was my, my thing. People trusted me. And when I had my employees, those were the rules. The rules were they had to be like me. They had to, you know, they had to have the same kind of thinking, honesty, trust. And, you know, my employees, uh, for every one of my employees, I think uh, the huge companies needed to have 20 to 30 employees because it was powerful having these kind of thinkings. So I teach my principles of business. Um, if they want to know good marketing ideas, you know, we can have discussions, but this is what my keynotes do. So you have the foundations of, of good, sound business thinking. So when you're um, doing your speaking engagements, um, you talked about 
um, how, helping people basically learn how to think like a business person. What are some of the problems that most people you meet seem to have when it comes to starting or setting up their business? Um, problems they have. Well, let me think about this for a moment. They don't. They don't really have problems because when you start up a business, it's just the ABCs of how to do it, you know. So for that, their accountant can tell them this or that. But it's their thinking about the main problem they have is how, how they think about it. They think that um, if they are selling, for example, um, uh, let's say they sell copiers, just threw that out, that they just have to sell copiers. No. You don't just sell copiers. You can go in, and if you go in to sell copiers and you see there's a need for um, adding machines, you say, and you go in selling copiers and you say to them, do you have anything else that you're really in need of that you're looking for? No matter what it is, ask questions. Success is knowing the questions to ask. Now, how do you learn the questions to ask? You keep asking questions and more questions until you come across something that makes sense to you, that can, that can relate into your business growth, that can relate into money. Um, and, and you also have to go the extra mile for the client, meaning, for example, um, one of my, sometimes my clients would need things like in an emergency, and I used to have to figure out how to make that possible. For example, one of my uh, hotels, the, uh, they needed a bellman's cart. The, the purchasing agent made a mistake and didn't order a new bellman's cart, and a real VIP VIP was coming, and they wanted a special, beautiful bellman's cart, and they didn't order it. So I stopped and I thought, and I said, how am I going to help my customer? And by the way, my customers can get fired if they don't do their jobs right. So for me, it always felt like a huge responsibility. I would have been like that anyway. So I called up a very prestigious hotel that was down the block. I knew every square inch of Manhattan because I walked the streets all the time to hotel to hotel. And I, and I said, would you get in trouble? No, that's not what I said. I said to him, do you have two of the F2s? So that was a kind of brass, beautiful luggage cart. He said, yes. I says, if I can get permission for you, could you walk that luggage cart down to the hotel down the street? He said, I'd be happy to, Mrs. Skolnick. I called up. I forgot which department I called. I probably called operations. I don't remember the department, but I asked permission, and I told them the problem, and I says, I'm sure they'll help you one day, blah, 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 blah. So all this talking on the phone, because I was still in – my office it took me no more than 16 minutes from call to call to call or waiting blah blah no not even that it took less than seven minutes the new luggage cart for that hotel was there from 16 minutes from the moment he told me his problem to the moment he got his luggage cart his luggage cart the big thing so let me tell you what that did first of all customer saved his job second of all that customer, for as long as he lives, as long as he lives, will think of me first. Because that's the most important thing. That's another important thing, is to try to find a problem that a customer has and then solve it for them. And, man, they think of you forever. You know, being a hero is very, very important. So I like that story because I can just envision all these people working and doing and getting the job done. So um, is that what you question? Was that the answer you question? <laughs> it's funny because I can see the I can see the bellman pushing that brass cart down the streets of Manhattan to get it to the place, and all the while he's he's doing it with a big smile on his face because he he's oh my doing God. it for you. And, well, and no, 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 no. He's not he's not doing it for me. No. He's doing it for his fellow man. In other words, he's doing it for another, another human being that's in trouble. You see, it's, it's not for me. It's not, it's not for me. You know, when you, when you, I don't want to say motivate people, but, you know, I said, could you help this person? 
It's so important to have people love people love helping people. You want to make people happy, you find a way for them to help somebody else. So the operations guy in the hotel, he felt good that he was able to help a sister hotel. It wasn't a sister hotel, it was a competitor, but still, you know, I told him this guy was going to get fired, he's going to be in trouble, so he was happy to help. And, and the uh, bellman that, that pushed the bellman's cart, he was happy to help the other human being. That, those are things that people don't really think about. They just get so caught up in, in having things look a certain way, and it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. You just you have to look for opportunities to help people. Like I look for opportunities not only to sell and, and help them with products, but also to help them with their job and their business. And by the way, that's how I became somehow, some way, I became I became the person that the general managers of these massive hotels would call. They call me up. And they'd say, you know, would you come over to my hotel? I want you to take a look at this or take a look at that. And um, as a matter of fact, one hotel, the Plaza Atene, which is on 64th, if I remember correctly, which was a five-star hotel. Mr. Uje was the, I believe, the general manager at the time. And he said, Mrs. Skolnick, he says, oh, Mrs. Skolnick, I want you to come up and see one of the guest rooms. He says, i got to improve it. We're having a VIVIP. And they used to get you know, people, very diplomatic people from all over the world. So I did a walkthrough of the room and I looked around. Um, now, you got to picture this, okay? Picture this. Me, Sheila, coming from less than nothing <laughs> in a project, now doing a walkthrough for, a, I don't know, a president of a country or whatever. Made me giggle. At any rate, I look around the room. And I see these two windows side to side, and I see this sun coming through the window. And when the sun came in, you can see all the dust in the sun. Do you know what I'm talking about? That stream? Yeah. Yeah. And I said, oh, my God. And I walked over to the guest room closet. I opened it up, and I saw a blanket and a pillow on the shelf. And I thought how warm this room was. And I thought, you know, I bet you this blanket and pillow rarely gets used because it's a warm room with all the windows and the sun because it was high up. And I said, Mr. Udre, I said, I guarantee if you take that pillow and blanket down, it's dusty because no one used it or needed it. He took it down and he went, oh, oh Mrs. Skolnick, oh, you have to help me because dirt is like beyond unacceptable. Beyond, beyond, over the top. It had to, everything had to be perfect. He says, oh, Mrs. Skolnick, how can you help me? So I said, Mr. Udre, um, I'm going to leave now, and I'm going to walk out, and I'm going to think about it. And I left, and I walked down the street, and I thought about it, and I went to Bloomingdale's. And I went up the escalator in Bloomingdale's, so I think it was on the top floor. And I, got a, and I went and I got a, a, a blanket, that was kept in, you know, when you buy blankets, they're in plastic bags, right? Yes. Okay, cool. So I looked at that, and I said, perfecto. I'll get, I'll get, I'll buy these plastic bags with a zipper, okay? And I'll get, I'll get the size they need. So I uh, opened the bag. <laughs> Sorry. I opened the bag, and inside was this little little tiny ticket that had an 800 number and the manufacturer's name. I, I left and I called him up and I said, and I, before I did that, I measured the size of a blanket, a queen size blanket and two pillows. I measured the depth, the width, so I knew the size that it needed to be. And I said to him, I would like to purchase this size, these sizes. You know, one was king, queen, whatever it was. And I said, he said, okay, fine. And I, he said, how many do you need? I said, I'll probably need um, about, I don't know, 300 to start. And that's a lot. That, that was a lot from just a phone call coming in. He says to me, I said, how much? He says, oh, well, they're uh, 49 cents each. And I said, 49 cents? That's outrageous. I says, come on, I'm buying in volume. And then I shifted to my buyerness, you know, buyers, well, you, well, whatever. And so I got the price down to 19 cents. 
And when I went to go see my client, I showed him it. He was ecstatic. I mean, like ecstatic. I had, by the way, I had the manufacturer send it to me overnight mail. I paid for everything. And I, I got it, well, two days later. And um, I put the blanket in the pillow. He was beaming like I was, like I was like, I don't know, walking on water. I have no idea. He was mm-hmm. so happy. And he said, oh, excellent. He says, how much? Because that was the favorite word. I said, well, um, a, a queen is three ninety nine a bag and a king is four ninety nine. He said, oh, wonderful. And he walked me down to the purchasing agent, gave me a purchase order number, had it rolled up, and I, I walked on air out of there. So, um, <laughs> so I sold thousands and thousands of those bags, and they were happy. Wow. So you, you got the price of the bags down to 19 cents. That's and then you sold them for three ninety nine and four ninety nine, and of course the hotel people, you solved their problem, and yep. they were happy, and you made a nice profit. That's the Very way to nice. do it. That's really well. Phenomenal. Actually, most of my profit was not a million percent. Most of the profit, my profit margin, um, sometimes anywhere, anywhere from four percent to. When, if, when I bought from China, it could be as much as 200%. Well, a profit is a profit, I would say. Th- that's mm-hmm. really interesting. You also talk a lot with people about um, communication and miscommunication with uh, employees. So when you're doing your, your speaking, how do you address those issues? Uh, about communication? When I, um, first of all, the most important thing is people, when um, people don't, um, people don't, I'm just trying to think how to, how to say it properly. Um, when people listen, they don't listen to hear, they listen to 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 respond. So they're not really listening to the person. They're just listening to respond. And the most important thing is to really focus, focus, focus on the person that is speaking. And when 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 I have my circle ups, that's what I used to do in my business, I would and this is more for my workshops and for my uh, group training and mentoring. It's, it's learning how to listen to people, like to shut your mind down and look at the person and really figure out if you can't see them. You know, what are they saying? What are their needs? And, and shut your own mind down because people are listen to respond. They don't listen to hear. And, and that's where a lot of problems come. I, I think you're absolutely right on that. You also talk a lot about um, what to do when employees are out sick. Can you talk about that a little bit, about how to keep the information flowing? Oh, (laughs) Um, in my company, when I started my baby company, it was me, and then there was 10, and there was 20, then there was 30, and there was a whole bunch of people. So um, I, I needed a... I needed what they call now a CRM. I needed a database system so it would imitate real life. Um, so I created this um, database so it imitated real life. And in each field was information. And the information, all the information was there. Not only was all the information there, but if a new employee sat down, they knew exactly what was needed when they spoke to the client to make sure all the information was there. Um, And when they spoke to them and they had conversations, you know, uh, um, Steve uh, was out sick. He had a skiing accident and he came back. And so, you know, the next person would call. He would remember to ask how Steve was, how his kids were. Um, Also, for an owner, lots of times when I would do consulting, which is, you know, I don't do consulting at this time. I just take my knowledge now and, and broadcast it in groups and in large 
large things, large environments. But um, you, you need to, you cannot have an employee that isn't recording everything that he's doing. Otherwise, how are you going to know? How are you going to know what is time? And, and everything is time stamped. So you know when they did it, what time they did it. And if you see huge amounts of time go by and there's nothing there, guess what that means? Oh, went shopping at uh, Amazon.com. So it's, it's a way of really... Um, it's a way of really looking and seeing what every employee is doing um, and how they're doing it and if, it's, if, if there's results. It can also, if you do the proper searches, you can see what problem is going on in the industry that you're in because it'll show up in everybody's uh, database. It'll just show up. I mean, there's a million ways that this can help. Um, oh, God, I just remembered something. Yes. No, it just tickled me, not happily. I had, um, in my company, when I first started, I only hired women. It's not that I was only hiring women. That was not it. I didn't have money, so I needed minimum wage people. I mean, minimum, minimum wage. And who came to answer the ads? But women, not men, but women. And it was no problem. I just taught and trained them. I was, as I was teaching myself, I was I taught and trained them like I taught myself first if it worked then I teach them that and so you know basically my company um, originated from people that knew nothing just like me nothing but we but I learned it and I showed it to them and then one day I'm I'm looking around and I notice now my company is bigger and now we have assets now we have deep pockets right and I look around I go oh my god I only have women here I'm going to get sued. Oh, <laughs> I am going to get sued. So I said, well, you know what? Since I'm at a certain level, so I went and hired um, this man who was, um, he had all sorts of accolades. He was trained in this and trained in that. And um, he worked his own way, whatever that was. At any rate, I had to let him go because uh he was getting nothing done. He looked like a man. He was a man, but he was getting nothing done. Um, he, he'd go out for lunch, come back late. He would be there, and I'd look in the database. I saw nothing, nothing, nothing. So at any rate, um, after he left, I went to retrieve the data that, you know, his specific job. He wasn't in sales. He, was, he had to do with, um, I think, inventory and uh, um, things of that nature. And he, wrote, he took notes because I saw him always taking notes. But guess what? He did it all in French. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing now, but when I remember, I'm going, oh, my God, we are so in trouble. But that just, I'm sorry, that just, um, that just reminds me of that. Well, th oh, I got it. Wait, that reminds me of something else. I got this other thing that I teach and train people in my seminars and in my keynotes. I say to them, what is, what is Sheila's favorite four-letter word? And people would sort of kind of answer me, and I go, no. My favorite four-letter word is next, which means if there's a problem, do not dwell on it. Don't try to sit there and fix it forever. Don't analyze it. Just move on to the next thing. Don't talk about it. Don't gossip about it. Don't remain there in the muck. Just move on and go to the next thing. Just keep it going positive. Keep it going positive. Now, you know in business you can't have everything be perfect. But when you, when you have thousands of rooms and you have thousands of hotels and, and there's so much to be gotten, you know, dwelling in the, the caca is not the place to do it. And I'm very, and I, I used to teach and train, don't do it. Just use my favorite word and carry on. For example, I had hired this woman and she, I gave her my uh, special interview test and she passed it. And she sat down to work, you know, nice lady, nice lady. And she was just uh, going to be doing some, you know, calling, whatever. <clears throat> anyway, um, two o'clock comes. I go, where, where's the new woman? 
And they said, she, oh, she never came back from lunch. And I said, what? And I went back to that area. And I said, because, you know, because I had an open floor plan before open floor plans were the things. And I said, so what happened here? You know, and I made everyone circle up. I go, what happened? Why, why didn't she come back? What happened? And they all said, they, nothing. She said she was there and she did what she had to do. And then it was lunchtime and she left. Fine. Three weeks later, I get a letter from um, the labor department, a certified letter saying that um, I owed this woman three weeks' salary. I did not pay her. I need to come down with my books and my records and everything else and go to a hearing and have a trial. I don't even know what they wanted from me. So I looked at that and I thought about how valuable time is and that I'd have to get caught up in insanity. You know, sometimes insanity just lands in front of your face. You have no choice. So I just turned around and I shouted out to my controller who was all the way across. I yelled out, Lori, just write this check and send it certified mail. And then I, I looked around and I said, what are we doing? Next, we left it alone. We paid the three-week salary and we went on. Because what was going to happen? We were going to get involved with someone else's craziness? Uh-uh. You just go next. You, if, if it's a really, really very expensive, then you just, you just got to do what you got to do. But you can't get involved in insanity. You don't cause it and you don't get involved in it. Well, oh, that's certainly good advice. So tell me a little bit more about how you work. You, you do a lot of keynote speaking, and so you go speak at different groups and organizations. And what other services do you provide right now? Um, well, I love keynotes because I get a um, – I like the response that I get because – the thing that I am most passionate about, and I think that's such a stupid word, but people use that word. The thing that, because I'm so passionate about my husband and grandchildren, but um, I'm passionate about is um, giving other people the information and knowledge that I have acquired in my, in my life. You know, passing it on, passing it forward so they can grow, so they can have the kind of life they want, so they can send their children to college. You know, my employees all made enough money to send all their children to college. I mean, it's like a, a little rock in, in the lake. It causes all these ripples. So I'm very passionate about that and, and seeing, you know, and, and, and seeing things change. And this one woman who was, one of my, who was in one of my speaking engagements, she had a, a service for waitresses and waiters, you know. And then after she heard me speak, she, someone said to her, I had said to her a week before, two weeks before, would you like to cater a wedding? And she said, no, we don't do that. Well, she went right out and got that person back. And now she caters weddings. How's that for a huge jump? <laughs> well, I know from just listening to you, Sheila, that, Obviously, it's like gold nugget after gold nugget that the information you dropped and, and people listening, if, if they just stop and think about how you think and how you use questions to, you know, keep going and then how you look at things and, like you said, next. I mean, you talk about how to change your way of thinking, how to think outside of the normal, I guess, you know, outside of the box, I think is too cliche to describe. Oh, it is too cliche. And then you've also, uh, I love the way you see problems and then you went and found a solution and then you didn't go, oh, we're going to buy bags from Bloomingdale's. Uh, you know, you said, oh, I'm going to, create something and get it manufactured and go from there. So you, you know, you actually reverse engineered the concept into creating a brand new category for you to sell to all of those hotels. And, mm -hmm. and you also are, you talked about you, you worked, 
you walked the streets of Manhattan day after day to go create these relationships with people. And I, I want to ask you if you can, because of today's world um, is online, can you address how someone might look at some situations online and how you can use that way of your way of thinking in in creating an online uh, business? Well, before I do that, did I tell you why I installed the press kit, the iron, the ironing board in, in the guest room closet? Yeah, tell me more about that. Okay, because that one everyone knows, so that's why it's my favorite. Anyway, I used to do 17 trade shows a year, which was very, very hard work. And when I get to a hotel, they were usually business hotels because they had the great big uh, halls downstairs. And, you know, a Marriott had 3,000 rooms, and it, had, it was a business hotel. So everyone needed an iron and ironing board. So I would get there to the show the day before, and I'd, I'd ask them to bring up an iron and ironing board the day before. And I put it under the bed because I knew the next day it, I wouldn't get it in time. And then I'm doing that. And on the third day, I said, you know, other people are having to have this kind of problem as well. I said, that's crazy. So before I left, I went down to operations. Was it operations? Yeah, operations. And I said, um, I, said, how, I said, how many housemen bring these irons and ironing boards up? He said, five. Okay, I said, how many complaints do you get? I said, because they can't bring enough up. He goes, a lot. So I took that, you know, I took that and I calculated out. Um, I said, thank you much. And I went back to my New York because that's where I always start everything in Manhattan so I can go and see it. And I calculated for them that, you know, if they had an iron and ironing board in every guest room, that they wouldn't have to hire these five men to do that that ridiculous job. They can use them for some other work in the hotel. If they didn't get fired, because there's always a lot of work to do, um, excellent hotel. Plus, it would eliminate all the bad complaints that they always get. And I calculated out for them the cost of the product and the cost of the housemen and the cost of the complaints. And I sold about a half a million of them. <laughs> I started out with uh, I started out with the Marriotts, and then I went over to the Hyatts, and I said, you know, the Hi the Marriotts have this in all the rooms, and they went whoa, and then I just did it all over. I just did it all over. So that was the press kit, and um, there was a lot of other things. But anyway, the other that's that brings you to the point of when you're in a specific industry, the more you're in it, the more you know about it, the more you can understand, the more you can see, and you have to observe every, every, everything around you. Now, I know I learned that from my childhood because I lived in a very dangerous community, very dangerous, and really, I don't want to be dramatic, but my life depended on it. And uh, um, so I learned observing. So now I'm telling everyone, you got to observe. you got to walk around and observe. you got to look here and there. No matter what you look at, you look at it and say, Is that, could, could that be used in a better way? Can I create something better? You just have to get your mind going like that and going. So your question is, what else do I do besides speaking? Yeah. That was one I, of your questions? That was one of, your one of my questions, questions ago. Um, the other thing that I love, love, love to do, I love to do um, masterminding, masterminding. And I can do that in person. And I like to do things in groups because the groups get things going. Like when one person says something, like I facilitate the group. And if they get off track, I don't let them get off track. You know, I, I get with them and I tell them point blank, listen, here are the rules, whether it's a, a coaching group masterminding group, consulting group, I go, here are the rules. All A personalities, leave it at the door. Nobody over talks. I tell someone who speaks next, next, and next. And I said, no cross talk. So what I'm really doing, Tamara, is I'm causing them to focus on the person who's speaking and not to think about what they're thinking. Because if they don't focus on the person speaking, they're missing out on that person's golden nuggets. Okay, so those are the things I like to do. I like to do, and I like to do it online. It's I can do it online. It doesn't matter. 
I, as a matter of fact, I have my group in Chicago. Um, I, I have a group in Chicago that I'm doing now, and it's it's great. You know, I do it. Um, I can do it as much as I want, but I, I have to decide. So I meet with them um, online twice a month, and we what we do is we um, each person has an opportunity to state an issue or a problem they have. And then we, we get out there and, and hopefully, we, and, and we do solve them. And if no one can solve it, I help them solve it. And they love it. How do I know? They keep coming back. <laughs> well, I, I can understand. You get to go first. If, I say, you get those that I say, um, the first people to, R, I said, I let you go based on who was RSVPs in what order. Man, those buzzes go off fast. So anyway. So here's the other thing. You ready? How do you know? How do you know something's good or not good? Well, what do you think? How you know something's good or not good, Tamara? Well, for me, it, it, I get a feeling, or if if it's something I'm selling, I know if I know if people are buying it, it that it's that I've hit on something good. Okay. Tell me, Sheila. So I would I would say you're half right. Okay. It's, if it's good, you look at your results. I don't believe in a feeling. Um, it's all about your results. That's it. End of story. How do you know you did good? You look at your results. How do you know the product is great? How many did you sell? How do you know the product lasts long? Get no returns. So you always have to focus on your results and get out of your own head. Don't do feeling. Don't do things. Focus on what are my results? Did they buy a lot? Did it last long? Understand what I'm saying? Oh, now, I will yeah. say one thing. When, when you, I created many products, and I learned that when I create a product, I have less than three months to boost it out there because then everyone copies you. But so what? I create more. What's your next question, Tamara? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So basically, create something spend 90 days getting it out there because someone's going to grab onto it and, and try to duplicate. Tell me how people can find out more about you and your services. Thank you. Um, go to SheilaTalks.com. That's S-H-E-I-L-A Talks, T-A-L-K-S dot com. And that's my website. And um, my picture that I have up there is a picture of me at my first big speaking event with a standing ovation. And just know, when they all stood up, I thought they were attacking. I had no idea it was a standing ovation because it was my first. But that's, you, you'll see that. And it shows, um, it has some of my speaking engagements that I did. Um, and, of course, my phone number, if anyone wants it, 631-875-1000. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. I've learned so much, and wow, such beautiful golden nuggets, and I really enjoyed learning about how you created your business because the things that you talk about are really, they make a lot of sense, and asking all the questions, that makes just tremendous sense. So I really appreciate that. Everyone, SheilaTalks.com. Thank you, Sheila. And Tamara, you are a great, great host. Thank you very much for asking me. I appreciate it. This is Tammy Patzer. Go make it a great day. You've been listening to Women Innovators with Tammy Patzer. To learn more, please go to womeninnovatorsradio.com. And please do subscribe and share to spread the big messages and big missions to change the world.